The room was suddenly filled with the wind whipping all around, despite it being hermetically sealed. The sisters stood in their ranks and raised their bolters as their hair and robes fluttered in the turbulence. As suspected, it was the combination of an attack, for at the far end of the room, two beings seemed to just coalesce out of nothing. One was a power-armored marine of the Thousand Sons, the mighty archmage Zamet Haket. The other, a Goliath, even amongst the Startes, space marines. He wore gray armor with hazard stripes on segments. It was Ossus the Unmaker of the Iron Warriors. Bolt around slammed towards them, the air tearing apart was shot and the terrible echo of their reports. But none hit. Not one. A field of shimmering purple energy held all back harmlessly, evaporating them as they struck the field. Zemet Haket looked impassively at the women in black armor as a pair strode forward and flames erupted from their weapons and covered the egg-like shield again. But no flames passed its bounds. He then turned to his colleague and spoke. Adeptus Sororitas, the Emperor's own. Their blood is sacred, so is of worth. Take them, but leave as many alive as is possible. At that, the towering Ossus unsheathed his two-handed power weapon and flicked a switch. Energy crackled down its blade as he simply nodded and moved forward. A flick of the wrist and a hand mudra and intonation from Zamet Haket, and Arsus appeared behind the Sisters of Battle. Arsus's sword swung and cleft Sisters of Battle, but only removing limbs, not skulls. As he tore into them with a fury none had ever witnessed or even thought possible. Zamet Haket entered the bridge of the Iron Warrior's flagship. It was like going back in time, to a period when there had been no heresy, had been no knowledge of the Dark Gods, for it was functional and efficient. It had no warp twisting or even aura, unless one looked intensely hard. It was there, but muted, controlled, unable to fully expand into the space. The Iron Warrior's vessels looked so much like an Imperial at first glance, an unsettling effect on the Thousand Sun who viewed it. Zamet Haket closed on the central figure of Tarax Antarax and opened the dialogue before he was even noted. So, I was not expecting to see you in the Comet of the Wordbearer. The huge form of Tarax Antarax turned and he sneered as he saw the Thousand Sun and retorted. I am in nobody's comet. I am simply making common cause with he and his master, out of enlightened self-interest. What's your excuse, conjurer? Conjurer? <laughs> I see my assertion has ruffled the feathers of a son of Perturabo. How predictable. So, if it's predictable, why have you set out to annoy me? while on the bridge of my own ship, surrounded by my own men. Bravery, stupidity, or hubris. None of the above disappointment. I had not expected the legendary Tarax Antarax to have so short a fuse. I wished only to while away the moments before we arrive. We are here to forge bonds, build bridges now. No. I didn't agree to join any sewing circle. I don't give a rattling sphincter about your sensibilities, your wishes, or your friendship. We are here to see if we can be effective, if our forces' combined efforts equate to being greater than the sum of the parts. This is why we are here, wizard. If you say it is us, then it surely must be thus. Allow me to return the disappointment. A thousand son who backs away from a hard topic or fight. What a surprise. 
I was always told that of all the whelps in the Thousand Sons, you were its most audacious soul. Well, after Arzek, of course. Do not say his name. I still consider him a traitor. A fool who should not be smiled upon by the Crimson King. I will not have his foul name spoken in my presence. Really? Well, well, well. I had heard something of all of this. But to have it confirmed is... useful. And there I was, thinking you were attempting to gain little secrets out of me. Not come to fill me in on all of yours. At that, as I met her kid's face darkened. Some secrets are for keeping, some are for spending. Ha! <laughs> What did you get from the expenditure of your precious coin, O oh snake charmer? That you are interested in the goings-on of our orders. That you are not as stupid as you look. That you have plans of your own. That you would see yourself in the frame of a primary mover. Oh, very incisive. Or oh, not. Perhaps I'm just needling you out of boredom. For old time's sake, eh? Something like that. I still remember the days of war between our kinds, after the Rupakar fell, after the scouring, when we were forced into the eye all those years ago. Difficult times. Some wounds are still fresh, no? Ha! I enjoyed every second of the trudge from terror. Every second. The endless sieges where we would bleed the sons of the raven, the lion, the wolf, the praetorian. How they threw themselves at us with such wrath. How we butchered them as often as they did us. I raised in power with every battle. Every contender smashed, beheaded or impaled. I enjoyed every second of it. And of course, I enjoyed the war between the legions. I particularly enjoyed killing wizards, if memory serves. It's been such a long time. I really must reacquaint myself with it. The feeling of wizard blood seeping through my gauntleted hands as I crush their heads and push my thumbs into their eyes, squeezing skull to shattering, pushing until the grey goo squelches around my thumbs. No feeling quite matches it. But the most fun part is, of course, wiping the stinking offal off my hands afterwards and instantly feeling cleaner because of it. Like my Primarch, I do so despise wizards. Zamat Haket smiled, but it was a thin, unwelcoming thing. Alas, it seems you have only ever faced weaklings and phonies. For this I know, you would not last against a true disciple of the Crimson King. None can. <laughs> oh, now that's funny. I seem to remember Prospero being smashed by the dogs. Your brothers being the food for their wolves. Your towers cast down by them. Did that happen? I was so certain it did. Ha! Huh. They needed the Sisters of Silence, Ordo Sinister and the Ten Thousand to be present to do it. All while our king fought the urge to destroy them. Well, he was certainly victorious that day. Old One-Eye was so good at fighting the urge that the dog took his head off. That did happen, yes? <sighs> and allowed his apotheosis. In many ways, I believe it to be a sacrifice he made subconsciously. So powerful is the mind of our king. Oh, that's how it works, is it? I sacrifice men all the time, both ours and theirs. By that rationale, I must be a grand wizard then. I never even knew it. You are swiftly closing on the borders of my patience, Captain. So, what are you going to do about it? Chant in a dead language while rocking backwards and forwards for comfort? Or what I always suspected? What I always knew would happen? Nothing. You are correct, of course. I could release my will and restructure reality to my whim destroy you and every last iron water on this vessel. But I will rise above your petty slings and arrows. I shall do the thing that the gods have done for so long. Ignored you. As that, Terex and Terex stepped closer to the Met 
I would genuinely enjoy watching you try. Go on. No? That is the real difference between us, wizard. You grub around in musty libraries in search of tricks and advantages, begging and praying to others for power. I take it. What you call power has no worth, and that is the only thing we agree on, for I feel exactly the same about your parlour tricks. And with that, a wind whipped up for a second, and the wizard was gone, transported back to his own quarters, by his will alone. The next the two were together was the day of the event. They had sent sub-officers as proxies to represent them in the scheduled meetings, verging on insulting, but only verging on. But both now stood side by side, only meters between them, as they looked out from the bridge's vast screens. Beneath them was the shrine world of Eleusis, still under repairs, it would seem, or new construction even. For once, not so long ago, during the Age of Shadows, it had fallen to chaos. Then the very holy church, the Ecclesiarchy, had been corrupted and spread the foul teachings of chaos to the entire population. The streets were places of hunting packs, the cathedral smeared in filth and excrement, or plain pulled down. All was desecrated, all was degradation, until finally the Ankylos Crusade had come with the burning fire of faith, and they took back Eleusis with Balta and Blade, purging all that crept and crawled the face of the planet. Then they brought a new populace, reconsecrated every last inch of the surface, and Holy Mother Church pumped resources into the planet to return it to the brilliant beacon it had been. It was heavily defended, for the sisters of the Adeptus Sororitas were present in strength, a formidable opponent to most, but not to Chaos Space Marines, not they. The fleet had made it into orbit, and were clearing the remaining special defences with attack craft and precision strikes. Again, to anyone else, the defences would have been formidable, possibly enough to dissuade even the most determined assailant, but this was the Iron Warriors, aided by the Masters of the Warp, the Thousand Sons. Their combined might swept all before them with ease. Now the two, Tarax Antarax and Zamet Haket, seemed to bask in the fruits of their labor, as the last minor starbase exploded like a flower of gold and silver, gray and fire. As the flare subsided, the two turned as one and looked each other in the eye. Ready? Oh, yes. Are your men making good progress? Oh, yes. They'll be at the outskirts of the main city in a quarter of an hour. At the gates within another quarter. Our barrage makes that inevitable. The distraction is in play. Excellent. Your guns do not shoot the citadel itself, I hope. At that, Tarax Antarax raised an eyebrow and dipped his head slightly. Then I shall be away. Oh, no. You're not going alone, not for this. Zemet Haket just inclined his head slightly and said, Of course. Would you care to join me? Again, no. I don't do witchcraft. If I want to teleport, I'll use a set of Terminator armor, thank you very much. But don't worry. You can take my Master of Executions, Ossus the Unmaker. I'm sure he will keep an eye on matters, and ease your passing into the inner sanctum, of course. Of course. Zamet Haket stretched out a hand to Ossus, with a simple pendant on it. You must wear this against your flesh, if you are to come with me. The large marine looked at his master, then extended his hand to accept the pendant, and slipped it over his head. And then the two of them seemed to blow away on the wind, a wind that had not been there only moments before, leaving only sand where they met Haket and Ossus their maker previously stood. Continued at the end of the law.
Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and war gear of the Warhammer 40k universe, the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. And today, we are to discuss the many weapons of chaos. Well, in brief, an extended look at them would take a while, so let us just get the basics down at the moment. And so, as usual, for the very basics, let us lean on existing wisdom. To quote, Demon Weapons A demon weapon is a mighty artifact of chaos, a blasphemous union of the Materium's matter and the Immaterium's spirit. It is most often given as a gift from the ruinous powers to their favoured mortal servants. As the name implies, a demon weapon is a weapon into which has been bound the essence of a demon. Most often, a close quarters weapon, although demonic ranged weapons have been encountered. Quite often, the demon is bound into the weapon as the result of a punishment rendered by its patron Chaos Guard, but at times, exceptional mortal servants of Chaos manage to entreat a demon to assist them in their exploits of slaughter and the demon binds itself willingly to its bearer. A demon weapon is a sentient item that grants tremendous power to its wielder. The weapon itself is often quite destructive in its own right, and nearly all demon weapons allow their bearers access to their demonic senses, heightening their perceptions of their surroundings. The bound demon, if it has not been driven to insanity by its imprisonment, can also counsel its bearer or even manipulate him. Bound Xenian demons are particularly fond of this approach. The simple fact of bearing a demon weapon is a source of immense prestige amongst the servants of the ruinous powers. A true mark of the favor of the gods, and the bearer will soon see his personal flock swell with eager underlings. But this power comes at a dangerous price. The bound demon cares nothing for mortal frailties nor limitations, and will rebel if its bearer does not use it for constant slaughter or the fulfillment of whatever the demon deems to be its own personal goals. If the bearer does not succeed in controlling their weapon, they will be killed as soon as the weapon finds a better prospective wielder, quite often by the contrivance of the demon weapon, as it withdraws its support at a critical moment. Demon Weapon Types Demon weapons are by their very nature unique, for every demon is a unique individual. However, weapons containing the essence of a similar types of demons will have similar properties, and the power granted to its bearer will ultimately be in accordance with the power of the demon bound within. A blade containing a lesser demon will be as a child's toy in comparison to one containing a greater demon, but will be much easier to placate. And even a weapon containing the least of warp entities is already a blasphemously powerful item, able to channel raw immaterium energies to sunder and destroy anything it strikes. The Ordo Malius has identified many types of these blasphemous weapons to better oppose them. Chaos Undivided Demons of Chaos Undivided, who become bound into weapons, will often take the following form. Accursed Crozius An accursed Crozius is a mark of office of a word-bearer's dark apostle. When the chaplains of the word-bearer's legion willingly embraced Chaos in the days before the start of the Horus Heresy, they ritually desecrated their once sacred weapons. Bound within these talismans of Chaos, is a demon of Chaos Undivided, who grants the Apostle additional protection and oratory prowess. Black Mace This malefic mace is said to have been cursed by each of the demon Primarchs. One who is struck by it instantly collapses into a mouldering pile of bones, while the curse spreads in a deadly shockwave to all those foes of the Dark Gods in the vicinity. Blade of the Hydra Long ago, this oversized chainsword was of purely ceremonial use, since the demon prince Garol 
of the nine sundered souls was bound inside it, however. The blade has been a fiendish tool of destruction. Those with a will strong enough to control its multiple thirsting mindsets can cause the sawtooth blade to shimmer into not one, but several swords that gnaw and gnash with an immortal hunger. These extra blades are insubstantial when the wielder wills it, and razor sharp when the flesh of his enemies is near. This artifact is only available to the heretic Astartes of the Alpha Legion. Claws of the Black Hunt These vicious hooked talons have spilt the blood of thousands of victims since their creation in the Soul Forges. Worn by the master of the Black Hunt, a vicious ritual that precedes the greatest of Night Lord's invasions, they are so encrusted with gore they are almost black. This congealed fluid is so thick it cannot even be seared away by the vicious energy field that runs about each claw. This is seen by some as a clear sign of a gory blessing from destructive guards. But even when the wielder swipes the air near a foe, not quite making contact, the victim's armor and flesh still mysteriously part as if slashed open by a fierce and invisible beast. This artifact is only available to the heretic Astartes of the Night Lords. Cursed Crozius This artifact was once the rod of office for a founding member of Lorgar's chaplains, one of the first of his kind to be sent into the Legionis Astartes in order to watch for signs of sedition. In truth, it has always been the weapon of an arch-traitor. First used in anger to bludgeon a praetor of the White Scars to death, it still bears the indelible stains of that first treacherous kill to this day. The wielder of the cursed Crozius is instilled with all the knowledge they need to slay the loyalist thralls of the Corpse Guard. This artifact is only available to the heretic Astartes of the Word Bearers. Dark Blade A dark blade is jet black, containing no reflection or marks that mar the perfect satin darkness of its blade. Although the hilt, pommel and grip are openly richly embellished. The Dark Blade is a hungry killer that feasts on the souls of the slain and urges its bearer on to further acts of barbarity until it is sated. Dread Axe A Dread Axe contains the bound essence of an entrapped entity with a vampiric thirst for souls that is especially partial to destroying demonic rivals. These bound demons hate all others of their own kind, and a Dread Axe is especially efficient when used in combat against other demons. Ether Lance The Ether Lance is a demon weapon which acts as a conduit to the warp. Its bearer can launch bolts of empiric energy at his foes or draw them into the lance, eventually consuming them utterly while powering more blasts from their weapon. Kai Gun A Kai Gun resembles a huge bolter of archaic design, so large that a normal man would be unable to lift it. It is a two-handed weapon that acts as a psychic catalyst, turning the hate and malice of its wielder into tangible bolts of potent energy. The Murder Sword So deadly are the wounds from this blade that some believe it is actually the Anathame, the legendary cursed weapon suspected to have laid low the Warmaster Horus within the swamps of Davin's Plague Moon. The sword is undoubtedly of eldritch provenance, for with a sacrificial ritual it can become the bane of a certain foe above all others. Demon Weapons of Corn Demons of Corn are only bound into a weapon as a punishment, or when they are vanquished by the Blood God's foes. They utterly detest this imprisonment, and quickly become insane as a result of their captivity and inability to actively engage in slaughter. Argath, the King of Blades When a demon is bound within a weapon by its infernal master, it rarely submits willingly to this terrible incarceration. The same cannot be said of Argath. A lifetime of slaughter and zealous dedication saw this butcher granted demonhood. Such was his devotion to corn 
that instead of accepting immortality as a demon prince, he instead chose to take the form of a deadly blade so that he could spill the lifeblood of Quan's greatest enemies. Their hand guided by Argath's spirit, the sword's wielder becomes nigh unstoppable. To wield Argath in battle is to become one with the blade itself, for the demon guides his bearer's every thrust, parry and killing blow with unerring accuracy. Countless are the rival Chaos Champions and mortal foes that have fallen to its power. Axe of Blind Fury Bound within this fabled power axe is the essence of a greater demon. It rages against its eternity of servitude, resulting in grievous violence against the enemy and sometimes its owner or his allies. Axe of Corn Infused with the insatiable bloodlust of Corn's own rage and fury, an axe of corn is a mighty weapon borne by bloodthirsters and favored mortal champions of corn. It is not a true demon weapon in the strictest sense, for it is not sentient and will not rebel, but the rage of the blood god will spur its bearer to commit carnage to a point that he will lose any instinct for self-preservation he might still have possessed in his pursuit of more blood for the blood god. Berserker's Grave A berserker's glaive takes the form of a mighty two-handed blade and contains the essence of not just one, but an entire host of blood letters incarcerated within the fabric of this great sword. Their collective rage drives the bearer into an apoplectic state of bloodlust. As the blade hews through its victims, the demons within drink deep of the essence of the slain, amplifying their wielder's bloodlust to ever greater heights until they are little more than a living engine of death and destruction. The lesser demon's fury at being imprisoned is transmitted to the wielder who will be forced to constantly fight to control it. However, this very fury will also tremendously augment the bearer's aptitude for carnage in melee. Bloodfeeder Bloodfeeder, another form of Axe of Blind Fury. Carnage and Slaughter The bloodthirster Scarbrand wields a pair of demonic axes called Carnage and Slaughter that each bear the caged fury of a bloodthirster within them. To face the exiled one in combat is therefore to face the combined wrath of three of Korn's greater demons. Firestorm Blade A mighty greatsword sometimes seen in the hands of Korn's most favoured bloodthirsters. The Firestorm Blade is a massive straight sword engulfed in an impossibly bright nimbus of white fire. At the whim of its wielder, the blade can discharge great gouts of flame at targets within a considerable distance, burning its victims with overwhelming warp fire. Only one Firestorm Blade has ever been seen within the Vortex, wielded by a powerful mortal champion by the name of Mithras. The man and his army descended into the lower Vortex with dreams of conquest, and were never heard from again. Many claim that his blade and other similar objects are still out there, just waiting for someone powerful or insane enough to claim them. Forge Whip It is a long-held belief of numerous blood cults within the Screaming Vortex that Korn himself created the original Forge Whip from the essence of a flesh hound he wished to punish for failing to catch its quarry. All those that have witnessed the power of a forge whip can attest to the inner fury of the weapon and the way it seems to seek out targets of its own accord. The weapon takes the form of a long whip with many tendrils, each of which appears to be made out of fire and glows with a white-hot inner heat. The fire records twist and rise, crackling with energy and burning the very air around them. Great Axe of Corn easily the most recognizable symbol of the Blood God. The Great Axe of Corn is one of the most destructive Cornite demon weapons. Enormous and frightening to behold, each is a horrific fusion of bone, brass and blood. Its grip is wrapped in the skins of champions foolish enough to challenge the wielder 
and its blade is forever slicked with the blood of every head it has taken. At the heart of each great axe of corn, trapped with the strongest warp binds imaginable, is the essence of a greater demon of corn. The rage from their imprisonment knows no bounds, and their fury lends near unlimited power to each swing and to each strike. Gore Whip These belts of twisted blood-red sinew are studded with sharpened chunks of broken bone. Each arcing swipe of a gore whip creates a crack that shakes the sky and a burst of energy that can rip a man in two. They are often characterized as one of the chief weapons of Korn's avatars, the Bloodthirsters, and any mortal lucky enough to possess one is said to have Korn's direct favor. Hellblade Forged from the essence of a vanquished bloodletter, a Hellblade is a standard weapon wielded by other bloodletters. Like an axe of corn, it is not a true demon weapon in the strictest sense, for it is not sentient and will not rebel. Heart Ripper A rarity for a demon weapon of corn, a Heart Ripper often takes the form of a rabid, snarling Reaper autocannon. The twin barrels emerging from the jagged moor of the bloodletter or flesh hound bound to the gun. Each time the gun fires, it howls with rage, imprinting Korn's fury onto every warp-enhanced shell. Unlike other ranged demon weapons, the Heart Ripper still needs to be reloaded, although whether this is to feed the ammunition hoppers or simply to feed the demon within remains a mystery. Kartoth the Blood Hunger According to the whim of Korn, the demons of his realm take part in an immense tournament. Korn takes the demon sword known as Kartoth, the Bloodhunger, which is capable of cutting through not only matter, but also time, and hides it within one of his flesh hounds. The legions of Korn fall upon each other with sword and axe, slaughtering and butchering whilst hunting the flesh hounds, who tear apart any demon who approaches. The demon, brave, strong, or fortunate enough to slay the flesh hound containing the demon's sword, becomes the Lord of Slaughter, and may wield the blood hunger. For a day or an age, as Korn sees fit, the Lord of the Slaughter enjoys great privilege in battle. When Korn wearies of his Lord of the Slaughter's exploits, the blood god begins the tournament again. A flesh hound devours both wielder and sword, combining their essence and the demons battle again, until Korn finds a new Lord of the Slaughter. Soulfire Lance Taking the form of a twisted spinal column, or collection of broken bones stretched unnaturally into a long staff, the Soulfire Lance is a gateway to the Immaterium. Each time the bearer squeezes the lance, the demons within howl, unleashing a vortex of empiric energy that draws its victims into the lance itself. Demon Weapons of Nurgle Weapons containing a demon of Nurgle serve as a conduit for Nurgle's favourite diseases and pestilences. Angarach A weapon perhaps more infested than possessed, Angarach has a long history and has changed hands more times than anyone cares to recollect. A lesion chainsword containing the bound essence of one or more Nurglings Angarach exists to spread illness, and is too stupid a creature to realize the indignity of its situation. More enthusiastic than most other demon weapons, it revs its motor and draws pus-filled oil with annoying regularity, perhaps explaining its frequent change of ownership. Fathers of Blades Rumored to be the original plague swords, created not long after Nurgle came into being, the ancient Fathers of Blades have spent millennia spreading corruption. Their cracked and rusted lengths deaden the senses of those nearby, and any who mistime their swings find their attacks deflected off its corroded edge. Balesword These plague-inflicted blades are favored melee weapons of the Heralds of Nurgle, called Poxbringers, and the Blightlord Terminators of the Death Guard Traitor Legion. Man Reaper A Man Reaper is an enormous power size that has been dipped in the filth of Nurgle himself. 
carrying a shard of the plague god within. These virulent weapons are much sought after by the servants of Nurgle, even if they sometimes claim the life of their bearer as well. Pandemic Staff A pandemic staff is a close combat weapon that acts as a vessel of Nurgle's favorite contagions, their afflictions joyfully spread in the materium. Plaguebringer Plaguebringers are forged from the very essence of Nurgle's best diseases and are utterly fatal to any living being that the weapon comes into contact with, even the toughest of foes. The standard weapon of plague bearers, it is not a true demon weapon in the strictest sense. Plague Knife The hallmark weapon of the Death Guard Traitor Legion, which was originally their close combat blade. The Plague Knife is a broad trench dagger, which was a brutal and efficient weapon in hand-to-hand -hand combat. When the Astartes of the Death Guard were transformed by the corrupting influence of Nurgle, these blades transformed as well. Now they have become plague knives, corroded weapons coated with rust and numerous diseases, the better to spread Father Nurgle's vile blessings across the galaxy. Only those pure in his sight, such as his plague marines, are granted such a weapon, and any lesser being suffering even the slightest wound is gifted with one of his innumerable creations, such as Nurgle's Rot or the Weeping Pox. Plague Sword A plague sword is a large, corroded, one-handed sword that drips with venomous pus and the pestilent blessings of Grandfather Nurgle, its touch being utterly lethal to mortal foes. Pus Cleaver This blade bears the infamous gurgling doom contagion one struck by the blade typically only has a few agonizing solar seconds left to live before they finally realize the glory of Nurgle's generosity and keel over gurgling phlegm. Only servants of the plague god may wield this artifact. Demon Weapons of Slaanesh Weapons containing a demon of Slaanesh seek to overload the victim's senses, inducing a long and excruciating agony instead of slaying them outright. Bliss-Giver A bliss-giver is a demon weapon that takes the form of a slender blade or writhing whip, whose merest touch can induce a pleasurable coma, allowing the victim to be captured alive. Lash of Torment A lash of torment is a demon weapon resembling an animated whip that twists and coils with a mind of its own, feeding on a victim's terror and pain, before telepathically sharing it with any beings who were close by. This is highly entertaining for servants of Slaanesh, and utterly horrifying for its victims. Needles of Desire take the appearance of a long, slim, double-pointed needle inscribed with blasphemous runes within runes, all the way down to a microscopic level. One half is embedded in the arm of the Chaos Champion bearing it, while it absorbs the foul narcotics naturally synthesized by champions of Slaanesh, allowing the bearer to inject those into other beings using the other end of the needle. The bearer will often share this gift with friend and foe, and while to another servant of Slaanesh it is an incredibly intense and pleasurable experience, the drugs contained within are utterly fatal to anyone or anything else. Witstealer Sword a Witstealer sword is a demon weapon utilized by the demons of Slaanesh, particularly his greater demons, the Keepers of Secrets. As this weapon bites into flesh, it saps the foe's mind, stripping more away with every cut, until nothing of their memories, personality, or sanity remain. Demon Weapons of Zinch Weapons containing a demon of Zinch either boost the bearer's psychic powers or allow him access to psychic abilities he would be incapable of wielding on his own. Bedlam Staff A Bedlam Staff is an ancient demon weapon that takes the form of a stave which is exclusively employed by Thousand Sons Chaos Sorcerers to use as a foci for their powers. The few remaining examples of these fell weapons are steeped in ten millennia of wild psychic power. Enemies struck by these powerful staves have their nervous systems overloaded by warp energies, 
rendering conscious thoughts from their mind, leaving them unable to act and vulnerable to further attacks. Dream Screamer A Dream Screamer is a demon weapon that channels the psychic power of its bearer into howling bolts of arcane energy that rip their targets apart. Kazat T'Chal Once a weapon proudly serving the Astro Militarum many thousands of ten years ago, the flamer now known as Kuzat T'Chal has been a demon weapon for so long that it barely remembers existing beyond the bizarre flesh and steel of its prison. Once a flamer of Zinch, the demon now projects its multicolored flames through the mutated nozzle of the flamer it calls home. Pandemonium Stave Potent demon weapons of immense power. Pandemonium staves are wielded only by Zinch's greatest champions. Longer than a man is tall, and consisting of a single rod of roughly hewn and psychically bonded black granite, these staves tend to cast unnatural shadows, drawing in nearby light and growing softly in a pattern that can make those that stare at it too long feel sick. The dull glow quickly changes to a bright white when the wielder channels his own psychic energy down the length of the stave, and the demon contained within screams out, adding its own caged fury to the power of the attack. Seer's Bane The Lord of Change, Malak's Rakatax, was cruelly punished by Zinch for having the temerity to utter an undiluted truth in his infernal master's presence. Now bound within a sleek blade, Malak Rakatax scythes through its victims' minds even as its keen edge cuts their flesh. Psychos are especially susceptible to this harrowing mental assault, as Malak Rakatax uses their innate connection to the warp to tear their soul to shreds. Warp Blade A warp blade is a demon weapon that is gifted to the mightiest of chaos sorcerers, a most devious of plotters. A warp blade has the power to dissipate and scatter psychic energy aimed at its bearer. This tends to attract the denizens of the warp, who hungrily sniff out the source of the power and can be set angrily upon by bystanders. End quote. Ah, demonic weapons. How fun they are. In the most twisted and grimdark way, of course. But I do like them due to the fact that, in my mind, they show the simple trade one makes whenever one kneels to the dark gods of chaos. Oh, they will lend you power. They will gift you might. But every use of that power brings you more under their control. More in their thrall. And they will turn on you in an instant. Whether it makes sense or no. Whether it be logical or no. For none can fathom the dark desires of the Chaos Gods, and they are fickle. One day, we shall see entries on some of the most famous and interesting of the demonic weapons, like Draknyan. But that will be something to look forward to, as each one has a tale worthy of the telling. I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. I hope you have enjoyed this brief introduction to demon weapons. If so, then please do consider liking and subscribing. If you do, then hit the notifications button, as I would not want you to miss out. If you see the worth in what we are doing, then do also consider joining our Patreon, or giving the video a share if that is beyond your present scope. It would be a great boon. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo. Ossus the Unmaker was a truly gifted warrior. The Adeptus Sororitas, the Sisters of Battle, were armoured in powered warplate of their own, were as nimble and vicious combatants as any mortal humans who had ever lived. But he was an Astartes of the Long War. He had danced this dance a thousand times before the grandsires of any of the sisters presently before him had even been born. And the skill and power levels quickly told. Appearing behind the block of them as he did, Ossus tore into the sisters with his power sword, taking arms and legs from multiple sisters as he went. Some turned to engage him, evading him where they could, firing back when possible, 
But Ossus knew his armor, knew his skill, knew how this entire conflict would map out before his first sword swing. He was Ossus the Unmaker, the first sword of Tarax and Tarax, of the Iron Warriors. He was born for this, made for this, trained for this, and he enjoyed himself mightily. The other half of the sisters were still firing on the Thousand Sun Sorcerer before them, his shields held, and then he waved and formed one sigil after another, with light coming from his fingertips. When each was tied off, it became a baleful effect. Sometimes it was a direct expression of hate, energy that shot out from his fingers and smashed and burnt all before him. Other times his spells would force a sister to her knees, screeching as her head turned inside out, or her eyes exploded, or armor constricted to crush those within with sickening, crackling noises. But he left most alive, as did Arthas. After less than a minute, the hall was littered with incapacitated dead and unconscious sisters of battle, and then the two marines just nodded to one another. It was then that their attention went to the central segment of the hall, a raised platform with stairs leading up to it. At its apex, a plinth. Atop the plinth was a simple cylindrical object of brass. The sorcerer ascended the stairs slowly, while the Iron Warrior stalked to the door to make certain they would not be interrupted. Two steps back from the plinth, Zemet Haket stopped. He then extended out his arms expansively, and a myriad of runes erupted into light across the entirety of his armor. The lights then seemed to pull out of the armor and fly above and around the wizard. They formed rings and chains around him as they twisted and twirled. Then one after another seemed to break off from the chains and expanded as it was projected towards the plinth. Shield after shield were torn down, as runes on the plinth lit as they then evaporated on the breeze. It took a quarter of an hour or more, but eventually the final ward was torn down, and the Thousand Sun then let his arms lower. Reverently, he reached out with his left hand and caressed the length of this simple horn. It was simple, unadorned, unblemished, and buffed to a shine. But it was ancient. Ancient beyond the Imperium, beyond the Age of Wonders, beyond the Age of Expansion. It was old as man, and its power was writ across it. Zamet Haket then took up the horn in his left hand. He turned on his heel, and then motioned for Ossus the Unmaker to stand back with him. The Iron Warrior padded back, leering at him as he went. Zamet Haket then put the horn to his lips, and blew and a note rang out. As it struck the walls and floor before them, the very rock itself seemed to float apart, or above it or around it, simply started to levitate and separate. Within one minute, the two marines could see the entire front half of the building had been affected thus. The rocks, metal, wood fixtures, all was just slowly floating apart. They locked on as each part then exploded back away from them. It was a tidal wave of destruction that went on for a half mile. The Iron Warrior turned to the wizard and nodded in approval. The wizard lowered the horn and stroked its length while gazing at it. This. This would tear down the defenses of the corpse worshippers. This would make a mockery of all of their efforts to protect themselves. The crusade could finally begin. It was writ, so it would be. The crusade could begin.